Welcome to The Freak Show. If you like unhinged interviews with unhinged authors, you've found the right place. I'm your ringleader and occasional bearded lady, author Eliana Poe. And today we are joined with Patrick C. Harrison III. Patrick, can you introduce yourself to our audience? Absolutely. Thank you for having me. I am Patrick C. Harrison III. You can call me PC3. And I'm an author of horror and splatterpunk. A lot of your readers might know me best for my most popular book, 100% Match. I've also written Grandpappy, uh, which was nominated for a splatterpunk award. Um, I've also, there it is. I've also edited for a lot of splatterpunk authors, horror authors like Aaron Beauregard, Daniel J. Volpe, all the, or a lot of the DNT publishing authors. You, your book, Muckbang, coming out in October. And so I've worked with a lot of people in the genre and I've written a lot of stuff in the genre. So that's me. And this is Nora. I was going to say, can you introduce your companion? Hi, Nora. Adorable. She's actually named after one of my characters. Does she write as well? Uh, Only when I'm in bed. (laughs) I've actually posted some stuff on Instagram with her looking at books and I call her the well-read wiener. Oh, Okay. I well, I like well-read wieners. So, um, <laughs> so um, for our audience that doesn't know, uh, we already did the intro once. Oh, I meant to say to that. I meant to say you fucked up about fifteen minutes worth of an interview. It was not fifteen minutes, but I feel god awful. I was like, he's like talking, and I'm like, I fucking forgot to hit record. So, um, welcome to episode two. I don't know what I'm doing. That's um, okay. You're good. So obviously you introduced yourself as the author of 100 percent match, which I have read. And uh I just gotta ask, what the fuck inspired the nasty in this book? Uh, so as I said last time. <laughs> <laughs> the first time around. No, um, so I was invited to do an anthology and um the stories they were wanting were 12,000 words, which for people that don't know, a 12,000 word story is very long for an anthology. And it's not typically long enough for just a regular book, like a novella or novel novel or something like that. So I wrote this 12,000 word story and it was originally called Perfect Match. And I turned it into the publisher. And for whatever reason, I don't know why the anthology fell through. And so I was stuck sitting here with, I'll put her down. I was stuck with this 12,000 word story. I didn't know what to do with because no other anthologies were going to take a 12,000 word story. And so I reached out to the author, Judith Sonnet, who uh, writes a lot of shorter stuff like that, about that length. And I asked if it would be worth it for me to put out a book of about 12,000 words. And she said, absolutely, that I should do it. And so I did. I put it out. I actually meant to put it out. Uh, January 1st of this year, but it, it actually ended up coming out December 31st. So it didn't, doesn't qualify for any awards, unfortunately. But wow. <laughs> yeah, I know. That's but insane. that's okay. That that's kind of on me. I I just assumed that Amazon was going to drag their feet on releasing it. So yeah. whenever I put it out on December, you know, I, I hit publish on December 31st, thinking, well, it won't go live till tomorrow anyway. And like two minutes two later. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. Within two hours, it was live, but that's okay. This is my fault. Okay. But anyway, um, basically, right away, it was selling pretty good. Uh, I'd sold pretty good in the first week, but like all my books sell good in the first week and then they kind of drop off. That's just kind of normal way things go. Um, but then I reached out to Duncan Rawson and asked him about putting my books on Kindle Unlimited because I noticed he had done that specifically with Womb, which is his best selling book. And he said it it's benefited him a lot as far as sales go. And so I, I put it on Kindle Unlimited and it just went crazy with sales almost immediately once I put it on Kindle Unlimited. And I'm not sure if it is because of Kindle Unlimited or if it's because around the same time a TikTok video about 100% match went viral. But yeah, ever since then, it's just been selling really well. And it's just, it really shocked me that it's done so good. Was it a positive review or a negative review for the TikTok video? Um, you know, the one that went the most viral, I have no idea. It's in Spanish. Oh. <laughs> yeah. It's, did you it's translate like... Did you translate the video or the, the book into Spanish? No. Oh, no. okay. 
I don't know if there's a it trans. It might be Portuguese. I don't know, but it's not English. <laughs> <laughs> That's funny. But, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Well, like I said earlier, um, prior <laughs> to not recording, um, you use bad reviews. And I noticed there was one the other day that said, I wish this author would drink bleach instead of water. And I was like, mm-hmm. that was really personal, but I really like that you post the bad reviews. So mm-hmm. what even inspired you to start posting the bad reviews? Um, I'm not sure. There was, there was one one-star review that I decided to post several months ago because it was saying all this ridiculous stuff about my book. And then like the last sentence, it said, the author obviously doesn't know anything about literary theory. And I'm like, what a ridiculous thing to say in the review of a splatterpunk book, you know? <laughs> and first off, what I wanted to say was, okay, I have a degree in English and I've read plenty of books about literary theory. And what I really know about literary theory is this bullshit. So give me a break on the literary theory. But I just thought it was so funny, the things she had said, and then ending with that. And I got such a big response from posting that review, like people laughing at it, making their own comments that, you know, basically anytime I see a really good one-star review that someone said they vomited or got sick to their stomach or something like that, and I'm like, okay, this one's a good one to post to Facebook. And those now, are all if, positive if, notes for a Splatterpunk book, though, is the thing. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. Like, if I get one that says he's a horrible writer, don't read him. I'm probably not going to post that. One. Yeah. <laughs> that, that one doesn't yeah. do me a whole lot of good, but. Yeah. Okay. Um, we've talked about this in the past prior to this <clears throat> fuck up, but, uh, Ran Pappy, I was lucky enough to have the original cover because I got off Etsy. Do you still have copies on Etsy? Uh, I do not. I think I only have maybe two or three total of those left and I've, I think I'm just going to keep them for now. Okay. Till they're selling for a few hundred bucks. A few hundred dollars. Yeah. I'll yeah. keep, now mine's personalized. So it'd be like double famous, hopefully. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> so right. I have It's basically like Stephen King signing a book to Peter Straub, right? Yeah. It's like the same. <laughs> yeah. Same thing. Same thing. Yeah. So you have a lot of other books, actually. I have quite a few of them. I read your short story uh, from these muddy waters which had a really oh, southern good. feel and I really liked it. Mm-hmm. Um, just like a Ronald Kelly, I like a lot of southern horror, actually, even though I'm from California. Um, I love Ronald Kelly, too. Yeah. But how many books have you published? I, I'm just looking at the pile that I have here. Grand Pappy, um, Hatch, Vampire, Nun, Spy, Bars. <laughs> I think I dropped one. The Splat Life. Oh, I yes. Well, too. Yeah. Um. I think I've published 11, I think. That's insane. I, I think so. Well, some of them are like those chat book size. Like after yeah. 100% Match has done so well, that's when I kind of came up with the idea for Splat Life is that maybe every couple of months put out a little chat book with the Splatterpunk story in it. And those haven't sold worth a shit, but maybe they'll take off at some point. But, Hopefully, yeah. Um, but yeah, let me say, I've only written... I guess two full novels. Even Grandpappy's not considered a novel; it's a novella. But uh, Vampire Knows Behind Bars and A Savage Breed are both barely a novel, and the one I just finished is a novel, and that'll that'll be, I guess, either number twelve or thirteen. I guess I'd have to sit down and count how many I published, but <laughs> yeah. but yeah, somewhere in there. Well, The Dark Side of Hell is the title of your new one, right? Mm-hmm. What is? Can you give me a little bit? I ha, I've seen you post about it, but nothing really about the plot or anything really. Yeah. Um. So it's kind of Halloween themed. So I'm rushing to get it completed and edited here before October hits or when October hits. But um, it's about this family, the Gibson family. They go to this like a spook house. You know how people have the spook houses around Halloween. They go about a week before Halloween to this spook house out in the country. And it really sucks. There's not a whole lot to it. They're walking through it, and it's just very lame. But at the end of it, um, this elderly man who's like man in the door, basically, the doorman basically, like hands them each a ticket and say they have tickets to come back on Halloween. And, of course, they say, you know, talking amongst themselves, it, it sucked. We're not coming back here. 
what they don't realize is on it's not a choice of theirs. On Halloween, they're going back to the dark side of hell. That's the name of the haunted house. It's called the dark side of hell. And it's uh, basically an invitation, a forced invitation into uh, the worst experience of their lives. It's very depraved. It's definitely splatterpunk. And uh, I'm probably going to upset some people with this. <laughs> it's, I would say there's torture porn aspects to it, but there's it's also going to take a twist. Um, might have some supernatural elements. So I think people are really going to like it. That's awesome. I don't know that I really heard of like splatterpunk with supernatural mm. elements. I don't know. I'm probably not very learned in the spotter punk genre just yeah, yet. You don't see a whole lot of it. I think, yeah. But I, uh, Aaron Beauregard had this one. What was it called? Shit. Oh, fuck. Anyway, he had a good one. Where one where he's coming out Daniel of the TV? Was... No, that one's mm-hmm. not supernatural. That's uh, that's actually my favorite. It is Modern Hysteria. But he that's had one where this this guy dies and basically goes to hell and you're kind of like falling in through hell, and, but there's ways to come back to the real world. But it was really fucked up. Too. That was a good one. I forget what it's called at the moment. Okay. But yeah. You, um, you really don't see a whole lot of supernatural stuff. It's kind of weird. No, but um, will you be doing a pre-order session or are you just going live? Um, if I do, it'll only be for a few days just okay. because I want to get it out really quick before Halloween. I don't want people only to have a week before Halloween to order it, you know. Yeah. Okay. Um, brain fart. Wow. <laughs> I was going to ask you if you're going to have it on Etsy. Jesus. Oh yeah, I will eventually. Um, Find copies and stuff. Yeah, I want. I definitely will have it on Etsy. It'll just. I'm not sure if it'll be before Halloween, which people by no means have to read it for halloween it's just no it's just it revolving around halloween yeah. that's kind of when i want it out yeah. but yeah i'll definitely have it on etsy so i usually try and only put yeah i usually try and only put up a, a few up at a time just to mm-hmm. people see there's one left or something like that they got to come get it you know but yeah i'll put some up for sure okay and it'll be up on amazon right yes, primarily absolutely. that's primarily where you publish right yes uh, i have a couple things on godless and oh, of course yeah. my Etsy store like yeah. on uh, like that uh, from these muddy waters that's only published on Etsy yeah you know, not published through Etsy but it's it's a limited run chat but, yeah you know and I like to have stuff offered from different platforms you know yeah this one I got number 99 of 100 copies oh look at you that's yeah. a good one <laughs> <laughs> oh, so when did you start writing you said you got into Clive Barker in high school so when did you start? That writing? was in the previous interview. I was said. it? Yeah. Okay. I'm sorry. I spoilers. <laughs> <laughs> so when which, which question do you want? When I got into Splatterpunk or when I got into writing? <laughs> well, I asked you. Let's see. Well, I asked you what inspires the nasty. Yeah. So what inspires the nasty? When did you start writing Splatterpunk? Versus okay, when I'll, you started writing. I, I'll just dive into all of it. All right. All of it. Um, I uh. I started writing, I think I wrote my first short story that wasn't like assigned for school, or I think in the sixth grade. And I wish I still had it because I know my mom kept it for a while. But um, it was after I spent the weekend with a friend of mine and with his family. And we'd gone walking down this little dirt road out by his house. And he was telling me about how if we stepped on his neighbor's property, we'd get shot at because the guy didn't want people on his property. And it oh, kind of inspired me. To, <laughs> yeah, I was Jesus. in sixth grade. And uh, so it kind of inspired me to uh, write this story. It wasn't about kids getting shot at, but about kids like walking onto this property and getting chased by like a werewolf type thing. But it, that was my first story. But I, you know, I'd always kind of liked horror and had been into reading stuff. I mean, I first started reading Stephen King around that same time, sixth or seventh grade. Got into Dean Koontz later on. And then, as I said previously, uh, in my high school years, I found Clive Barker. And it's just like, holy shit, this guy, you know, is a lot different. He really shows you everything, you know. And then, you know, several years after that, I 
I guess it was maybe 2017 or so, I found Edward Lee and realized there are no fucking holds bars. You can <laughs> write whatever the hell you want, pretty much. And so that's kind of how I got into splatter pump. But I've always wanted to be a writer ever since I was a kid. My my first choice was to be a baseball player, but I just didn't have the talent. <laughs> so so I figured out the writing thing, I guess. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Baseball. Yeah. Baseball. Yeah. That was my first love, baseball. It just yeah. didn't work out. That's funny because I told somebody I was a sheriff's cadet when I was 16, and that was kind of my plan. I wanted to go into forensics, wow. but I was like, I'm 22 now, so technically I would have been old enough to be a deputy. And I was like, imagine, right. imagine me, a cop. <laughs> well, I tell you what, having that kind of background though, that's excellent for writing fiction. Yeah. Knowing the inner workings of law enforcement. That I, I was a nurse for 10 years, mm -hmm. and knowing all about the body and knowing the blood and guts thing, like from seeing it and having to study it, that is very beneficial to writing horror for sure. Yeah. Luckily, I didn't, you know, I went to a dead guy's house once, but I didn't see the body. So, uh, we, yeah, I worked with animal control a lot, honestly. So, oh, yeah. Okay. Yeah. yeah. All right. Starting the sideshow. I don't know if you know, but I like to sponsor these episodes and another author decided to sponsor it. Today's episode is sponsored by author CJ Whitcomb. I don't know if you know of him. Um, his novel, The Abigail Carivo Saga, is a gothic tale of vampires. So here's the description. When a man is murdered by a secret society, it's up to his vampire daughter to avenge him. Along the way, she discovers a world of blood, sex, death, and darkness. Twists, turns, and mysteries await her around every corner. When a vampire from Abigail's past comes back into her life, Abigail's world is torn apart. She's the only one who can stop the evils of the world from destroying her home. So I haven't read a vampire book since like Dracula a couple years ago, but I do have... Um, vampire nuns behind bars and you can get that book on amazon in audiobook uh hardcover and ebook but i wanted to kind of segue into vampire nuns behind bars like i haven't read it yet i'm interested but is it as southern as something like from the these muddy waters no not at all and by the way that synopsis sounded kind of pretty damn good actually yeah i'll be checking but, out uh, yeah, it sounds good. But uh, Vampire Nuns Behind Bars is, no, it doesn't have a, a Southern take to it at all, really. It's kind of a dystopian future uh, type scenario. And what I, what inspired me to with for that idea was uh, the exploitation movies, like women in prison films and nunsploitation, and like the old Roger Corman films. And actually, the the original idea was not set in a dystopian future, but uh, my friends, Mike Innenbach and Chris Miller, each had ideas for these dystopian future stories. And we kind of decided to link all three of our novels into one book. And so that was originally in a book called Cerberus Exploitation. It's three novels in one massive book. So do I need the other two to read this one? No, no, no. Okay. They're only, they're very loosely, I mean, by all means, get them. But I'll I'll get them, yeah. <laughs> neither, oh, here's a here's the original book no longer out wow. cerberus exploitation so it's a, a fat, fat book. one <laughs> yeah it's actually got a forward by lloyd kaufman who uh is over trauma films you know him but now it's kind of a dystopian sci-fi lots of sex gore and vampires it's, uh, it's a lot of fun <laughs> sounds like a lot of fun um, something I was meaning to ask you also about the Splat Life series are is every book connected, or are they just at, like short stories that are disconnected? Um, kind of both. Mm -hmm. The first one kind of has an introduction story about this woman that something horrible happens to her, and she's at the end of it, she's being taken somewhere, and she doesn't know where. And at the beginning of the second one, the second one has a short story called Firecracker Kings. At the beginning of the second one, she's arriving at this facility and she's having to watch all this depravity. And so she's watching the next story happen. Now, at some chicken. point, <laughs> yeah, kind of. 
<laughs> Although she's watching it in a more fucked up uh, setting. Yeah. But um, at some point, I'm going to tie a knot in it, you know, and string it all back together. But I think for the first several, if they sell well enough for me to keep going, um, it's basically going to be her watching whatever story you're reading. Okay. You know? Okay. So we know her. We're experiencing it with her. Yeah. Okay. I got you. Yeah. But it's not necessary at this point to uh, read the previous one to read the next one because you're there's like one page of her and then you read the story that the next book is you know okay okay good to know and then um you talk about anthologies and stuff how many anthologies have you been in oh i have no idea um so a lot i don't know probably no i don't know if you'd say a lot maybe around 20 or so that's a lot yeah (laughs) i don't know (laughs) i'll i'll say this i I no longer submit unless I'm invited. <laughs> yeah. Because I get invited to a lot and I don't like waiting to see if I'm going to get rejected. <laughs> so. Yeah. No, I, I totally understand. I, I used to find submissions, research them, and then be like, well, what can I yeah. write kind of along the lines of this? And then you just get rejected anyways. And you're like, fuck. Yeah. You know, what do I do with this story? I, I recent, yeah, I recently saw one that's, that has a call coming up in January and I'm looking at it like, man, I really could write for that one. It's a, a horror Western one, which I've written some horror Western. So I was like, man, I'd be good for that. And it's a press I've never been involved with. And so I like, I like dipping my toes in as many presses as I can, you know, just because, you know, more people, you know, more people you're involved with, the better chance of getting sales and getting accepted and getting asked to more anthologies. So, but we'll see. I haven't decided if I have, a free moment i might try and write a story for that and what is your your western splatterpunk novel called uh yeah my splatter western is a savage breed so i thought i just didn't want to say it wrong but yeah that's one of them that i don't have can you tell us a little bit about that one yeah um so i had the idea for the book at the time i was co-owner of death's head breast uh, co-owner and editor-in-chief and I knew I had to be putting a lot of my time into the press and didn't have as much time as I wanted for writing. And so kind of selfishly, I was like, how can I work this idea into a Death's Head Press project? And so I came up with the idea of doing a series of books called the Splatter Westerns. And those started coming out in uh, 2020, the first one being by Wiley Young. Um, and I think we're up to maybe 16 splatter Western books. Now I've, I've since sold my portion of death's head press, but they're still putting out the splatter Western. So they're still rolling along. And it was all based on an idea that I kind of wanted to write a horror Western and <laughs> came up with this series. So, well, I mean, that's insane. That's you've inspired that many mm-hmm. books in the series from yeah, one. It's funny. I've, I've noticed people kind of doing their own horror westerns and they're also calling them splatter westerns and that was kind of a term that i assigned to the series but now everybody's kind of using it yeah that's so, awesome which is wow. fun yeah just yeah. you gotta put that in like your bio everywhere like inventor of the splatter western yeah it, it if i ever get a wikipedia page that'll have to be on <laughs> oh, i think you can get one now you just have to like submit your id to like google you can get like a google panel and then maybe oh, yeah. eventually somebody will make you a Wikipedia, yeah, a Wikipedia page eventually. Yeah. You just like take know. a picture I... of your ID. Oh, really? Like, you have to take a picture of your ID? So like with Google, like you can have your own panel, you know how like celebrities and stuff have their panel or whatever that comes up when you yeah. research them. So uh-huh. you can claim it. You have to send them your like some form of identification and then you can edit that. And then you can write whatever you want about yourself. You'd be like, king of splatter yeah. westerns you know, like, that sounds like a no on my part <laughs> just a suggestion okay yeah. i'll take it under advisement yeah <laughs> so you talk about a lot of sex and stuff in your books anyways um i think i made fallon uncomfortable with this question last time i asked it i don't know if you saw the episode but i asked her i said hey do you have sex with any of your characters so patrick would you, if you, I, I know you're married, but still a question. You created the perfect woman in one of your books or man. Yes. Um, 
yeah. So in Vampire Nuns Behind Bars and in my first novel, which is called Inferno Bound and the Hellhounds, um, the lead character, one of the lead characters is named Nora Avery. And that's who my dog is. <laughs> it's named your after. dog. <laughs> and she is basically a very promiscuous, very sexual, very attractive woman and um i can see your wiener dog like yes yeah <laughs> if my wife allowed it you know i may have relations with, that one. <laughs> with the character not the dog <laughs> yeah with the character not the dog <laughs> uh what who was she inspired by any actresses or celebrities um, or your wife or... yeah she was kind of inspired by my wife actually mm -hmm. um because i had written my first novel Inferno Battle on the Hellhounds was originally a short story mm -hmm. and I kind of left a hanging ending to mm -hmm. it and my wife had read it and she's like you cannot end it that way you got to keep it going and so I sat on it for a little while and was like how am I going to keep it going and the way I decided to do it was to introduce this new character to introduce this hot you know sexy lustful woman into the story and she's the Lust cop in that story. lustful wiener dog <laughs> yeah exactly and um so that's how she was created and that's how sh my short story became my first book that's awesome yeah. yeah it's just odd you know like writing mukbang I don't know how I got it I food horror was kind of the vibe that I went with <laughs> like I don't it's just gross you know like you did it in like 100% match and mm -hmm. I was like that's exactly why I chose you as my editor like people were suggesting people and I was like Mm. gotta be him because he's the only one that's gonna be able to understand i think this genre as mm -hmm. an editor like somebody was a contemporary editor and i was like you're not gonna get it yeah probably. yeah well i'll say mukbang i feel like is a lot more graphic than 100 percent match i mean you're a lot more detailed with it than i was Why? more pages i, I was in 100 percent match i was very nonchalant about it and not descriptive at all and if you get around to reading Grandpappy, it is much more like Mukbang than 100% Match because it is very, like, I go into detail. I tell you about the shit and the blood and the guts and yeah. all that. Whereas I kind of leave it, leave it up to the reader's imagination in 100% Match. I tell you what happened. Yeah. But I, I'm not descriptive about it. And that's why I think it's funny when so many of the reviews I've gotten are just talking about how over the top gross it is. And I'm like, yeah, is it? I mean, I think it's kind of your imagination that's doing that. Yeah. No, I really like it because, and I I like that people say that you don't know how to write because you wrote a character telling the, st it's exactly how the character would tell the story. You're not telling the story. You wrote the mm -hmm. character writing the story. Yeah, yeah. It's different. Yeah. Um, well, and that's kind of how I feel about writing first person is if, if you're writing first person, like 100% matches, you don't have to tell it detail because that person is seeing it if they don't want to get into the details they don't have to you know the reader can assume what they want to say it's kind yeah, of how i feel about first person you're inside the head of the character who knows how intelligent yeah. the character is it, it yeah, has nothing exactly. to do with you as the author and and with with that character in particular bart you know the grossness is very mundane very nonchalant what he cares about <laughs> is finding his true love yeah. So he's not going to be detailed about the grossness. Yeah. It's just something that he does and is there. It's not yeah. a big deal to him, even though it's he like does it. Everyday habits that we have, we wouldn't go into detail about them. His everyday right. habits involve cat shit and cat parts and his shit. And <laughs> yeah. Exactly. Mayonnaise jars. And <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I swear, I told Mayonnaise. I tell my parents stuff and I told them about the book afterwards. And my mom was just like, that's gross. And I was like, that's the point. Like, <laughs> Have so, they yeah. read Mukbang? No. Oh my God. No. It's the first book that my mom hasn't read. She's she read and she helped me edit the first uh few books that I did. And then hmm. Mukbang, she was like, I don't know. And I was like, Yeah. Yeah, my uh, my dad picked up grandpappy and I was like, Dad, just don't. <laughs> just don't. <laughs> <laughs> there neither one of my parents are into horror so it's kind of like strange that i got into it but you know i think they've read a couple of things of mine but my more splatterpunk stuff i'm like 
you might want to avoid that one yeah no my mom was grossed out by eating and eating is like here and like my thing's like you know like, uh, yeah, yeah yeah it's definitely gonna gross some people out for sure yeah i hope so that's the point i you know i think yeah. that's part of splatterpunk is you're able to express like crude humor mm -hmm. that you wouldn't be able mm -hmm. to like mm -hmm. i couldn't write that in a young adult romance i can't like no, <laughs> yeah goodness. yeah no i i agree i actually um uh, applied for a like a ghostwriting job to write that romance stuff and uh they said they wanted to hire this is a few years ago they mm -hmm. said they wanted to hire me and they wanted me to write down like three different ideas for the first project i was going to work on and none of them they liked because they were all and i was thought i was doing romance stuff but they said they're it sounded like it would be too violent or too graphic. I'm like, and they told me things they would like for me to change. I was just like, you know what? I don't need that. Violent. Job. What yeah. Were you, I mean, what were your ideas? <laughs> well, the one I most wanted to do was about um, this young couple, young high school couple that, like, the teenage boy is trying to climb up to his girlfriend's window and sneak in and see her. And he falls from the tree and dies. Okay. Well, then the Super girl. Romantic. Was, yeah. <laughs> the girl is in a panic, like takes uh, her dead boyfriend to her friend who is a witch of some kind. And together they bring him back to life. But now he's a zombie. And so it's like trying to, uh, he, she's trying to have a romantic relationship with this zombie guy. I thought it was a really cool idea, but they're like, that does not sound, maybe it's not YA romance, but they, I was like, no, it'll be good. It's a good YA romance. They're like, no. <laughs> I'm sorry. That that one, they were like, that one was a hard no. The other I ones thought, are, yeah. I did a werewolf idea that they didn't like because it sounded like it would have a bad ending. Like a, and what I mean by that is not a happy ending, which yeah. is what you're supposed to have in romance. And then the other okay. one, I I think was a romance or a, a Western romance. And I think that was the one they most liked the idea of, but no Christmas specials they, or Valentine's. No, no nice dinners. Just no, dead, dead I mean, boy. I wanted all of them that I had ideas for. We're going to have some action and some violence in them, but I thought that, what's wrong with having that being a part of romance. I don't spy know. one. That's action. Like, oh, spy. One. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I probably could have done that. But, you know, when they shot down my ideas, I was like, all right, fuck y'all then. I do my own thing. <laughs> I, I just, my friend just told me about some case where, like, this lady was getting rashes from her boyfriend and apparently it was some parasite because he was uh, fucking dead bodies. So I, that's all I could think about, which is the idea that's of a true the zombie. Story? Yeah, she was, it was uh, as far as I know, there's some bacteria from fucking dead bodies. <laughs> He was a mortuary worker. There have been more diseases caused by guys fucking things. Than... Yeah. <laughs> Just stop fucking dead things and animals, okay? And diseases will drop off by like half. Yeah. <laughs> oh my god. It's just, you got cheated on by a dead body. Like, <laughs> <laughs> and then you have to go to the doctor and explain it to the doctor. Like, yeah. Thank you, Daniel, oh, for telling me that. Yeah. Oh, that's that's messed up. Oh my God. Well, there you go. <laughs> Good note to there's... end on. Um, where can we find you and your work? Yeah, you can find all my stuff on Amazon, Patrick C. Harrison the third. Uh, you can find my sub stack is P3 PC3 Horror. I do movie reviews and keep everybody up to date on my new releases. And then of course my Etsy page is PC3 Book. Okay, I'll be sure yeah. to link those in the description so that way people right. can check it out. I did not know you had a Substack, but that's awesome. I do, I do. Yeah. Yep. Well, thanks for joining me on my show, and I'm sorry I record or I didn't record the first <laughs> half of your interview. No, you're yeah. gonna tell me in a minute. This one stopped like 30 minutes. No, ago. no, no. I keep checking the corner <laughs> of the screen. I'm like, it says record. <laughs> so yeah. All right. Well, thank you. Thank you for joining us. Hopefully, you guys had fun. Thank you. Thank you for having me. No worries. <laughs>